Are you still there, Casey? Yes, I'm here. Let me hop us. Hold on. Sure, take your time. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Let's um, hide that. Hi, friends. Pastor Casey here, uh, Director of Family Ministries at Foundry Church, and I'm joined by uh, Miss Megan Leahy, who is parenting coach and the parenting expert for the Washington Post. Thank you so much, Megan, for being here. We're so excited to have you today. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. Um, so I wanted to start and see if you might just tell us a little bit about yourself and your work and what you do. Yeah, so I'm a parent coach, which is a bizarre but real job. Um, I started as a teacher for all boys right out of college. I have a degree in education and secondary ed and English. And I was an English teacher and um, and I loved it. Um, but the boys kept asking me like inappropriate questions about what they should do with their dating lives and stuff. And I was like, mm. so. I can't legally answer those questions. So I went to Hopkins and got a degree in counseling. And uh, I was having my own children at the time and was like, whew, this is hard. Um, by the time I graduated, I didn't want to be a school counselor, of course, um, which, though thank God I went to school because I couldn't be a parent coach now. So I pivoted to starting to work with parents in, through the parent education program, which I highly recommend in Kensington, Maryland. And after my third baby, I became a certified parent coach. So I've been working with families and kids since 1998. Um, in some capacity, I've been coaching for 10 years and I've been writing for the post probably about seven and I write a weekly column. I have an online class and I just wrote a book out in August. That's awesome. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for telling us a little bit about what you do. Um, as I said, we're just so thrilled that you uh, are gonna have this conversation with us today. I wondered if you might tell us a little bit about specifically your journey to motherhood, some of the highs and lows. Oh, you know, when um, you guys reached out to me and I saw that question, I am not accustomed to answering that question because I'm always just giving information to other people. Um, my journey to motherhood was blessedly easy in that I met the right guy to have a baby with. <laughs> early and married him and got pregnant easily. And I was raised um, in a very matriarchal, strong family. I mean, my dad's amazing, but a lot of strong women around me. And I really believed I was going to be a natural mother. And I this was like my calling to be a mom. And um, it wasn't until I had kids that I was like, ah. <laughs> I feel that. Is this so calling? Hmm. So I'm a great baby mom. I'm an okay toddler mom, and I get good again in the later years. But um, my path in motherhood has, has always been surprising. And I think that for most of us, not everyone, it is surprising. Because whatever, however we think it's going to go, it doesn't. Whatever kids we think we're going to have, we don't. Um, and if you have more than one kid, you can't even believe you made them with the same person. They can be so different. And it's not even about like gender or anything or age difference. They're just different. So the path keeps changing and illuminating itself to me. But um, thank God I have this work because really, I think I just coach everyone out of my own selfish need to correct mm -hmm. my own mistakes daily. That's beautiful. I um, It really resonated with what you said about how uh, the parenting process, it feels like you're, you're, you're a different parent in different stages, right? Um, often when I feel like I'm measuring myself, I'm measuring the whole. Um, and you sort of breaking it out as like, as a good baby mom, mm -hmm. like that really helps um, sort of think about it as a marathon. Uh, rather than a sprint. Yeah, and I find that um, a lot of parents assume that they're going to be a great parent at every stage 
and at every age and for every child's needs. And um, a lot of us don't match up to our kids temperamentally, um, which we never want to admit because we think that that's a love issue. Um, but if you're an extrovert and you have an introverted child, you think something's wrong with the kid and vice versa. But I just find a lot of freedom in knowing your strengths and your weaknesses. You can find your way to the middle to keep connecting with your kid. Yeah. That's really helpful. Um, so how has COVID-19 shifted your role as a parent? We were talking a little bit about this earlier. <laughs> So I'm internally like saying a lot of bad words, but this is a church kind of thing. So um, it's uh, for me personally, you're asking. Mm -hmm. mm. So I don't really like to be with my kids this much. <laughs> I had a child every three years for about 10 years and I got them into school. And now like I was like, OK, here I am. I am doing my thing. I am running my business. My kids are happy, healthy, and in school. Oh, bye bye. Okay. I did all the things and now they're here. Um, that being said, <clears throat> once I get over myself, um, I, I really love it and we have found a rhythm. I feel very fortunate that my kids are old enough to make themselves meals, take them, care of themselves. There's no toileting issues. There's no Nobody's going to drink bleach um, or do something dangerous, you know. Um, so I think for like everyone else, um, to an extent, there are highs and lows. There are days where I experience great joy that I have this safe home and a partner. He goes to work every day, but still a partner and these able-bodied, able-minded, great kids. And I, I feel extraordinarily grateful. And then there are days where I'm not as grateful. And there's, a, I mean, in the therapeutic world, we call it rupture repair. There's a lot of rupture repair, rupture. And everyone in the house takes a turn having a rupture. And sometimes we're having lots of ruptures everywhere. So um, there's a lot of parenting happening and um, I just have to keep asking myself, how do I show up here? Not what do I do, but how do I wanna be? How do I wanna be? Yeah, that's a good question. How do I show up here? Um, mm -hmm. That makes me a lot. think a lot. Yeah, you know, how do I keep making my face calm and have like a little smile? You know, like have my eyes be peaceful mm -hmm. and not kind of maybe in the back of my mind where I'm thinking like, oh, my God, shut up, shut up. Right. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the parenting struggles that you're asked about most often, some of those parenting challenges? I imagine COVID might bring its own sort of separate list <laughs> um, or maybe they cross over. I don't know. No, for sure right now, the number one thing is homeschooling. <clears throat> um, we are not meant to be our children's teachers this way. Even the homeschooling parents will tell you this isn't homeschooling, right? So homeschooling parents, I mean, depend, unless you like really are just like in your house and do nothing, they go to zoos, they go to museums, they go to the, you know, civil war sites, they join up with other homeschooling parents. Their kids are on soccer teams. Like at least in this region and in a lot of regions, homeschooling is a very community driven act active thing. So first of all, this isn't homeschooling. Second of all, teachers train like a lot of years, four, sometimes eight, sometimes 12 years to be to do what they do well. And we haven't. And even if you did train to be a teacher, you didn't train to be your kid's teacher. Because we love our kids, so we're overly invested in the outcome. So when I used to be a teacher, I had love for those kids, but I wasn't so invested in their outcomes that I went cuckoo, right? So the number one problem I see is um, 
the parents are super ramped up and worried about their kids falling behind. I put that in quotes because I just don't even know what we're measuring that against anymore. Mm -hmm. All right, neither does anyone else. Um, and so they're creating, and I don't think any parent wakes up in the morning like, oh, man, how can I fight with my kids today about writing a paper about rats, which is like what my kid just did. Nobody plans it, right? But the schools give assignments. The parents are loving and good, right? And they're trying to do what's right by the, what the school wants. And then we have this. Mm -hmm. Because the kids are in their own sort of grief in and out of it. They don't have their teachers. They don't have their routine. They don't have their friends. They don't have, you know, so many, especially the younger the child, but even the older kids, routine rules. First I do this, then I do this, then we have this, then I go here, then I do. That's how humans feel safe. And as far as I know, parents can't do that well and work and keep our house from falling to shambles day in, day out. Never mind the parents, like my dearest friend whose daughter is severely dyslexic. What? I mean, what? You can't do that. So um, the number one problem I'm finding is um, the power struggles that are coming out of teaching. Mm -hmm. The second thing is siblings fighting because we are feeling locked in and we are locked in and some of us are really locked in sibling fighting, um, disagreements between parents uh, where you're, we get sick of each other. Um, and just, you know, tantrums and stuff, just the, just the explosions, especially for parents who are not accustomed to being with their kids this much. So you have both normal, when I say normal, I mean typical for the age developmentally. We have those explosions but then we also have the misunderstanding from some parents about what those mean and what they don't, mm. right? Because some of it's just like what it is, but if you have a parent whose child is in daycare from like eight to five, this to the parent is very upsetting. Right. They're like, uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's what I find these days. Yeah, wow. Um, I just wanted to, interject for just a moment. We have some some folks who might have some questions. So if, if we get some questions through the chat, would you be willing to answer some of those? Of course. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So we'll keep our, our eyes on the chat. And as those come in, I'll try to catch them and maybe we can answer some questions. Yeah. I think hashtag don't drink bleach. <laughs> hashtag don't drink bleach, please. I know, but poison, calls to poison control went up. I saw that. It's tragic. That. It's, mm, yeah. 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 Um, okay. So what do you think is the most important thing that parents and caregivers um, can prioritize in this moment? You spoke a little bit about sort of like peace in the face <laughs> and in the eyes and keeping calm. Um, but I wonder what else you might have to say about priorities right now. So I think that I love the Yeah, the priorities. Right. So when we are in the thick of it, which in this pandemic, we are in the thick of it. It's very confusing us for, right, for us right now as parents and as humans because we don't know, are things opening? Are we at the beginning of this? Are we, I mean, we're getting a lot of different messages right now and I don't know if they're right or wrong, but I am saying that kind of anxiety is hard for us. Um, we want a beginning, a middle and an end. But when we are in the midst, wherever we are of this, we can become mired down or bogged down by details of like worksheets and chore charts and things like that. And so I would advise everyone to get to the basics, get to the basics of the parent and child relationship. If there, if you have normal struggle, and I hate that word normal, if you have typical struggles, which is like, Disagreements here and there, crabbiness, typically sick of each other's stuff. Great. That's humans living together. That's hashtag family. Okay. 
if it's feeling fraught, if you're feeling desperate, if you wake up and dread seeing them, if, um, if things are really dark, I always tell parents to go to connection, right? Um, to go to a place where you take your foot out of their necks for getting things done or behaving a certain way and you do what you can to be with them in a place where your face is more like this, right? So special time, walks, shooting hoops, going for a drive is a great way to be with your child without constantly doing this, playing games, just putting aside all the like next, 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 next. Because when our um, nervous systems are as activated as they are, um, as adults, you know, we're just kind of all in a bit of a state of an anxiety spiral sometimes. Um, we can tend to clench and um, become controlling when we don't need to be. Um, so I would always tell parents, like, whatever your worries are, I would ask them, are they real? Is your, is your kid really falling behind in reading? Right? Chant I mean, the data shows that if you went to college and your spouse or partner went to college, your kid's actually going to be okay. Like, they're going to make it. Like, all the other kids who were in crisis before this, they're the ones who are screwed. Those are the ones we need to actually like go and find and <laughs> swoop up. Most of our kids, though, are going to be okay because everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's falling behind. Everyone's doing poorly. All of our kids aren't learning the way they should be. Right? So I would always ask parents to go back to connection, go back to fun, go back to silliness, go back to playing, go back to ease. You know, um, which is not a really like, that's a hard message for a lot of people. Yeah, I can Could imagine. 10 more ways to make my kids do this. But. Yeah, I was just looking uh, the other day with our youth group at Foundry of all the lists that COVID has created, right? So we're familiar, like BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed has lists about everything. But we specifically went down a, a rabbit trail of all the lists that are COVID related. And a lot of them are parenting lists. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk a lot about like, how can we best resource our parents and resources are good. We want our parents to have resources as well. But some of the things that you're saying are basic. Um, yeah, always get back to basics, you know? Um, for instance, Right. Um, I had a, I talked to a group of lawyers last week. And so these are hard charging folks, 78 lawyers who've never spent more than four hours straight with their kids mm -hmm. since their kids were probably like six months old. Right. And maybe a couple vacations. Not judging that at all. But these parents are suffering and they cannot stomach that their children don't listen. Or um, for instance, one mom had five-year-old twin boys. What a mess. And the one child is so perfectionistic and would cry and throw fits, right? And when things wouldn't work. Sorry, my dogs are barking in the background. Is it bothering you, Casey? No, totally okay. fine. I have a puppy too. Three kids and a puppy and another dog. So she, the child would break down in perfectionism. I can't do it. Rip up the paper. I'm out of here, you know? And so she would double down on the kid, right? That's not acceptable. That's not how we ask. It's okay to make mistakes. right? And so we kind of talked it out a little bit. And I said, you know, no one in the history of humanity has ever been told it's okay to make mistakes and been like, great, thanks. Now I'm not afraid. <laughs> Like we have to keep experiencing the mistakes and have someone supporting, uh, supportive and loving with us. But no one's ever learned anything because somebody told us, <laughs> like really learned it. Right? So we came up with a thing where they were going to play um, games of practicing losing. 
right? And they were going to lose poorly and lose nicely. And it was just a game. And so the mom was going to lose and throw a fit and, you know, throw a piece of plastic toy and move, move, stomp off. And then the kid got a turn, right? So we were kind of taking this problem. And rather than doubling down on the frustration, we were playing. Right. And then we and then when it felt good, they could play how to win. How to win Uno. So that's like a little thing of where you don't see the basics. But if you stop and pull yourself out of just what you want as a parent, what do I want? What do I want my kid to do? What do I want? What instead, how can I be? How can I be here? I can be patient. I can see that my child's struggling. I can see that I'm adding to it so I can be different, right? Yeah. That's high level parenting stuff, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's so helpful. Um, I noticed that we had a, a comment um, in the chat, particularly about a teenager. So um, I wondered, uh, Michael says he's asked his 16 year old daughter a time or two if she misses going to school and misses her friends and he only gets drugs from her. Um, and so he wants to know what you're hearing from other parents. And I think I just add on to that like teenagers is, is just a whole other level right now. So, what kind of wisdom do you have for us about engaging teenagers during this time? So, Michael, I have a 16 year old too. Um, Lisa Damore wrote um, a really great book. I don't remember the name of it, um, about parenting girls, <clears throat> but she has a number of articles out there. And one of them always describes parenting older children as being a potted plant, which means that you're not right in their face, but you're always around, just around. And so because a teen's life feels so insular, so walled off from us sometimes, you just kind of have to still be around, even if the conversation doesn't seem as sparkling as, and as like back and forth as you'd like. Um, something, sometimes with teens, you gotta, you gotta get in the car and go through the Dunkin' Drives Dunkin' Donuts drive through if it's safe, go get them Starbucks, go get them all that junk they want. Um, and you can say things like, um, you know, it sucks you're not with your friends, but do you miss your teachers really? And see what they say. I did that to my 16 year old thinking she would be like, no. She was like, I miss them the most. I miss my teachers more than I miss my friends, right? And we kind of went back and forth. Um, I shared stories about my own life and tried to relate and say, I don't know what I would have done at 16 with this, right? You could throw your assumptions out there, Michael, and see <clears throat> even if you can get a disagreement, not a fight, but like, no, dad, I don't, that's not how it is, right? That's a communication. But I wanna just encourage every parent, especially with the teens, to just not discount any effort. So any drive, any getting an iced coffee, iced latte, iced junk, junk, milkshake, McDonald's, whatever, don't discount any connection because the teens feel it um, and they feel you trying and it matters. They're never gonna turn to you and be like, this really mattered, thanks, <laughs> right? Um, and don't be afraid to buy some of their affection. Um, this is not something I would ever um, recommend in a non-COVID time. But I've had no problem paying my kids or offering some kind of whatever Lululemon junk headband for more, more work around the house or just to say thank you because my teen is like making lunch for her sisters every day, right? Um, again, you don't have to go wild, but whatever they like, buy them something. 
if that's their love currency, right? So Gary Chapman has the five love languages and um, he has one for teens. And I suggest people pick it up because every teen, you know, especially if you, if you have boys, sit down and game with them. I don't want to be stereotypical, girls game too, but the data is pretty overwhelming that boys game more. Game with them. You know, maybe they're like shooting people's heads off and ripping their skeletons out of their, you know, beheaded bodies. I don't know, but get in there with them. Learn something. Any way that you can increase proximity. Yeah, that's that's really helpful advice. Um, what about uh, motivation, particularly around um, teenagers right now? Um, oh, anything to share about motivation? Is this Camilla or Camila? The planning plan for college. Yes. Mm. That, it, that depends on if they're a senior or a junior. So if they're graduating and they're already in somewhere, you don't worry about it right now. I mean, right? Like yeah. that's happening and they're going to have all these steps of not having graduation, not having prom, not having all these things, not having this summer with their friends, maybe even the job they always love, <clears throat> the job they even currently have. The colleges will do what they need to do with your kids, um, hopefully. So um, um, if you notice a lack of motivation in your kids, I would encourage you to normalize that. So I would say things like, I get it. I wouldn't feel motivated either. You had steps, you know, one through 10 and now they're all gone. This is a weird time, right? Mm -hmm. I would just go ahead and agree with them. Because um, the last thing you want to do is cheerlead someone when they're down. Like, you're fine. We can be motivated, right? The kids are either going to be like, or just, you know, she doesn't get it. So I would give it some space. Um, colleges will do. As for the juniors, again, don't worry about it. I know that that's a crappy answer, um, but I'm gonna tell you to not worry about it right now. It will take care of itself. And I would try and get some courage and say that to the teens too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's just do day by day. Let's just do, you know, what the high school wants us to do. Let's just peek around at colleges. But this will figure itself out. We're just gonna do day by day, week by week. I just think if you push teens too much, you're just going to get more of what you don't want. That's some wisdom right there. Mm. <laughs> For sure. We'll see. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about all the places that people can can find you, but I have one more maybe quick question. Sure. Um, if you could tell all parents and caregivers of all ages anything right now, what would you tell them? Um, that we are going to get through this. The most important thing you can do is get through it with your relationships intact with your family members. So when we come out of this, we're going to have lifetime memories. We're also going to be in a collective grief. We don't even understand the loss yet. Our brains aren't there. We can't handle that because we're just staying safe. Um, everything, nothing will ever be the same ever again. But what can always be the same is your connection to your kids, right? That is their steady. That is the net they fall into. That is what makes everything else possible. College, school, chores, blah, 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 blah. All that crap that everyone wants can occur when the connection is like this. So I want everyone to focus on relationships. Relationships first will get us through this. Um, and that has to do with like your spouse, your partner, your friends, your loved ones. 
right? Kindness to yourself and kindness to everyone that is around you. And we'll get through it and we'll all be, well, we, we will be okay. Everyone will go to college or go to tech school or go to whatever. Everyone will be okay. It's all gonna be okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome, very wise words. Words I'm taking to heart for sure. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about how people can find you and get in contact with you. Um, your website is uh, mlparentcoach.com. Yep. Um, Instagram at ML Parent Coach. Uh, I just want to say your Instagram is hilarious and I will forever be a follower because there's so much solidarity. <laughs> I love it. Um, not very professional, but thank you, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and they also, I also want to talk a little bit about your book. So you have a forthcoming book. Uh, it's going to release in August called Parenting Outside the Lines. I wondered if you might just talk to us briefly about your book and then we'll let you go. Yeah. Well, if you can't tell, um, I'm not all that serious all the time. It's not a how to. It's just a lot of um, there's no data because that's boring and I'm lazy. And um, it's just really all my anecdotal stories of working with clients and raising my own kids and helping us find our instincts rather than just adhering to parenting theories, which can actually be the poison and not the medicine. Um, and it's really great because if you pre-order it now and you can go to ML Parent Coach and do that, if you pre-order it, anybody who pre-orders pre the book has access to free monthly Q and A's with me and they start tomorrow. And awesome. they're recorded. So yeah. Um, and there's also a pay what you want for those for people who um, may want to be part of the Q and A's but just can't swing the price. So that's all on um, mlparentcoach.com. Awesome. I hope that everybody gets an opportunity to check that out. It looks like we've dropped it in the chat as well. So uh, folks can just click from there, um, pre-order this book. Megan, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm you know, we talked a little bit about this, like I, I'm a parent of a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and I hope that this has helped all of our parents, but it has helped me uh, tremendously. And so it's just been an honor to be with you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Monday to be with us. You are very welcome. It's my pleasure. And all y'all with those youngins, you got to run them like puppies. <laughs> you just got to make their bodies tired. <laughs> their bodies tired. That is good, <laughs> good advice. All right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, it's been awesome to be with you. Good noon, as we say around here, and we'll check in with you later. So thanks for being here. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Stay safe. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye.